Hello, I'm Shelley Quinn. We're so glad you're joining us because we do this study for you. We just get to reap the benefits ourselves. I want to introduce our panel. I have James Rafferty to my left. Good to be here, Shelley. <laughs> we are <laughs> <laughs> we are blessed to do these Sabbath school quarterlies, and uh, we I have Monday's lesson, which is entitled "A Preface to the Cross." Oh, amen. And Joe Morricone. I have Tuesday. It is finished. I'm looking forward to it. Oh, me too. And Ryan Day. Amen. Love this lesson. I'm, mine happens to be entitled the same as the overall lesson. He died for us. It's Wednesday's lesson. Beautiful. And John Dinsey. Thursday's lesson, the title is The Meaning of the Cross. Amen. This is going to be a beautiful study, but before we begin, we'd like to start with prayer. Jill, would you like to say a prayer? Holy Father, we just come before you in the name of Jesus, grateful for the gift of Jesus and the mm -hmm. gift of salvation we have through his blood. Amen. Right now we ask for the infilling of the Holy Spirit that you would mm -hmm. attune our minds and hearts to hear what you have in your word for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. amen. Okay, lesson six, he died for us. Our memory text is John chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. This is Jesus speaking. Son of Man is his favorite title. Mm. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So this week we are focusing on Christ's death, and his resurrection, and what that promise mm -hmm. of eternal life mm -hmm. is all about. When God came down and took on human flesh, became incarnated, he was born a human to die. That was the purpose of his birth, was to die and pay the penalty for our sin that we might be released from that penalty. So in anticipation of this wonderful, justification mm -hmm. by faith. Mm -hmm. Our sinless substitute thought about this and he was repulsed at the idea of taking sin upon himself. Mm -hmm. He was horrified at the idea of bearing the righteous wrath of yeah. God. Mm -hmm. But listen to what he says in John 12, 27. Now my soul is mm -hmm. troubled mm -hmm. and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. Yeah. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Mm -hmm. I like what the author of mm -hmm. Hebrews says in Hebrews 12 too. He says, for the joy that was yes. set before him, mm -hmm. he endured the cross, despising the shame. And then afterwards he sat down at the right hand of the throne of the Father. What does he mean? The joy of the cross. He, and he endured the shame so that he could ratify the everlasting covenant, the new covenant, the everlasting covenant renewed by his blood. He enjoyed for the joy of resurrection. Mm. He knew, he prayed in John 17, Lord, Restore to me the glory that I had with you before I came to earth. So he was looking forward with joy mm -hmm. to ascending mm -hmm. and having his um, glory restored. And we know in Isaiah 53, it's mm -hmm. talking about the servant, the suffering servant. Mm -hmm. And it says that he will see the labor of his soul and be satisfied because yeah. he will justify many mm -hmm. and bear their iniquity. So the fundal, fundal, the fundamental event of the Christian faith is the resurrection of yeah. Jesus Christ. It's central mm -hmm. to That's our right. faith. And because he was raised from the dead, we likewise have that hope. First Corinthians 15, verses 17 and 18. Mm -hmm. I believe you quoted this last time. He says, th this is Paul speaking, and he says, if Christ is not mm -hmm. risen, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Mm -hmm. Then also those who have fallen asleep, that's a metaphor for death, are it, those who have fallen asleep in Christ 
have perished if he hadn't resurrected. So both the righteous wicked and the righteous wicked, both the righteous and the wicked, when they die, they go to the same place. They go to the grave. And without the hope of resurrection, we would all perish. Mm. So let's look at Sunday from the foundation of the world. My favorite scripture, mm -hmm. Revelation 13, <laughs> 8. <laughs> I, if you want to know what the everlasting gospel is, here it is, mm -hmm. Revelation 13, 8. It says that Jesus was the lamb slain yes. from the foundation of the world. Mm. I think that is so beautiful to understand that God had the Calvary plan in mind yeah. before he ever created us. Mm -hmm. Let's unpack that. Isaiah 46, 10, God says, I am God and there is no other, mm -hmm. declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things that have not yet come, mm -hmm. saying, my counsel shall stand and I shall do all my pleasure. Mm. So what we see is all the prophecies of God are being fulfilled. We have a great and so many prophecies about the coming Messiah, all of them were fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. Mm. So we can have great hope and trust in God's word because mm -hmm. he declared the end from the beginning. First Peter 1, 18 is another of my favorite. Mm -hmm. First Peter 1, 18 through 20. Mm. Peter says that we need to know that we were not redeemed by corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot, that spotless, everlasting lamb of God. It says he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but he was made manifest in these last times for you. Mm -hmm. So before God ever created the cosmos, he had the Calvary plan in mind. Mm -hmm. Now, why did God create us? He desired to have an intimate, he wanted children with whom mm -hmm. he could have an intimate relationship. He wanted to have us have reciprocal love with him. Even though humanity was not destined to sin, God in his foreknowledge looked and he knew what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. So what he did, the outcome didn't catch him by surprise, mm -hmm. but he was motivated by love mm -hmm. in advance to determine the Calvary plan. One of the Godhead, among the three they're talking, one of them is going to step forward and become a person mm -hmm. and pay, pay. The death penalty was established by God for sin. But he loved us so much. His love is so self-sacrificing mm -hmm. that he was going to come down and pay this death penalty because he knew that we couldn't pay it without perishing. Mm -hmm. So Jesus Christ, we refer to him as the second person of the Godhead is who became the person of Jesus Christ. That doesn't mean that he is second in authority, but he was second in the full revelation as a person. Mm -hmm. So he comes down to become the son of man and the covenant son of God. Mm -hmm. And his blood, Hebrews 13, 20 says, it is the blood of the everlasting covenant. And he gave his blood for us. Mm -hmm. Second Timothy 1, 9, it says, God has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, mm -hmm. but according to his own purpose mm -hmm. and Grace, mm -hmm. get this, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Mm. God's plan of salvation has always been by grace mm -hmm. in the Old Testament and the New. Mm -hmm. Titus 1, 2 says, in hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie promised 
before time began. Mm. What a creator we have. So he made this planet. And I've just recently spent a lot of time studying in Genesis. I want you to know that Adam and Eve knew the plan. Mm -hmm. The people of the Old Testament knew the plan. Paul says the gospel was preached to them just as it was preached to us. In Genesis 3.15, God announced the minute sin came into the world, mm -hmm. He announced His everlasting covenant, mm -hmm. saying that He was going, there would be a seed, mm -hmm. and that is Jesus Christ. There would be enmity between the seed of the serpent, which is Satan, and the seed of the woman, and he said that this seed would crush the head of Satan. Mm. The second person of the Godhead came down to become that seed. And then you know what he did? After God announced it, he introduced the sacrificial system that opened a pathway for righteousness by mm. faith. And as you go through the Old Testament, you see all of these mm -hmm. the saints were made righteous mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. faith. So. What we want to look at here, I, I need to get going, is, the, let me just make this point. The sacrificial system, we look at that and we think, ooh, oh, that, I've had people say, oh, it's so bloody and horrible. Why did God do that? Mm. Because he had to impress upon mm. the people's mind that what the consequences of sin would be he had to have them understand what it was going to cost him to redeem us. He had to humble himself to become a man and die in our place. Hebrews 10.10 10 says that we have been sanctified mm. through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Remember what John the Baptist, he's mm -hmm. baptizing at the Jordan and he looks up and he says, Behold the Lamb of God mm -hmm. who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. Mm -hmm. He didn't come to justify us by faith, to die to pay the penalty for our sin so that we could live like the devil. Mm. Isaiah 53 verses 6 and 7 says, The Lord has laid on him, this is one of the servant songs talking about the Messiah, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Mm -hmm. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. Amen. Amen. Gospel, gospel, gospel. Mm -hmm. My name is James Rafferty, and I have Monday's lesson, A Preface to the Cross, and we're just going to keep going from where Shelley left off. You know, the disciples struggled with understanding why Messiah came. Yes. They were not really recognizing it because the theology of their day was actually presenting a Messiah that was completely different from the one we just talked about that Shelley just presented in Isaiah 53 that was sacrificed from the foundation of the world, slain for our sins. The theology of the day presented a, a Messiah that was going to come as a conquering king, mm -hmm. conquer the Romans and set them up and give them all the grandeur of this world and everything that they, you know, had been taken from them. They were going to be, you know, enriched um, with the booty of the, the powers of this earth. And the disciples had bought into this theology. And so in Monday's lesson, we talk about how Christ over and over again was trying to get the disciples back on track. Mm. He was trying to get them back on the biblical track, the biblical truths. And so again and again, especially as he gets toward the end of his ministry, he tries to tell the disciples, to persuade the disciples, to, to share with the disciples what his actual destiny is as the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So we're going to look at a number of those verses. We're going to start in Matthew chapter 16, Matthew chapter 16, and we're going to start in verse 21, just read verses 21, 22, and 23. Matthew chapter 16, beginning with verse 21. From that time forth, Jesus began, or began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go to Jerusalem 
and suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and raised again the third day. Now remember, this is resurrection gospel that we've been talking about and emphasizing here. So the resurrection part sounds good, but the previous part idea of being killed, right, and suffering, that doesn't sound so good. So how do the disciples respond to this? Well, Peter is the first to respond of the disciples, <laughs> normally, usually, right? He's the one that steps out there and, and Peter took him and he began to rebuke him, verse 22, saying, be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But Jesus turned, verse 23, and said unto Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. Satan. Mm. For thou art an offense unto me, for thou savest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Peter, you have man's theology. You don't have God's theology. You're teaching men's doctrines, not God's doctrines, not God's truth. And Peter, you're not being inspired by men per se. You're being inspired by Satan himself. We're wrestling against principalities and powers. Theology is not all about men's ideas or men's interpretations so much as it is about God's inspired writings versus what Satan inspires us to understand. Mm. Those are the two powers that we're dealing with here behind interpretations of scripture in the Bible. Either the Holy Spirit has inspired the truth that we believe or that idea that theology is coming from the devil himself. And those are the two issues that we need to weigh here. And this is what Jesus is bringing to the front. This is the first time that we, or the first verses that we're going to read about, about Christ trying to get his disciples back on track when it comes to his sacrifice, when it comes to his mission. So the first thing they do is they deny it. No way. This is not happening to you. Then we see in Matthew <laughs> chapter 17, just, just over a few uh, verses here, Matthew chapter 17, beginning with verse 22, and we'll look at verses 22 and 23. And while they abode in Galilee, Jesus said unto them, the Son of Man shall be betrayed in the hands of men, verse 23, and they shall kill him, and the third day he shall be raised again. And they, just a short little response here, and they were what? Exceedingly, Exceedingly sorry. sorry. Now, this is really interesting when you think about it, right? When we think about the cross, when we think about the death of Jesus, when, when, when Shelley shares my favorite verse is Revelation 13, 8, <laughs> like, praise God. Right? But the disciples are like exceedingly sorry. Yeah. I mean, they have exactly the opposite uh, response. Do you see that? That's true. Why is that? because they had a completely different understanding of Messiah. I mean, it happens today. When we think about, for example, the second coming of Christ, yes. right? We're thinking, we're talking about the first coming of Christ, but let's think about the second coming of Christ. There are a lot of people today, if you were to tell them, we're gonna go through a tribulation, you know, it's gonna be a difficult time. We're gonna go through um, some hardships and even a great time of trouble where there's gonna be seven last plagues, but don't worry, God is gonna take us through that. He's gonna seal us. He's gonna, no, really? I thought we were going to be raptured out of that. People would be exceeding sorry today, mm -hmm. just like the disciples were. Absolutely. And why is that? Because the disciples' theology was being undermined here. Mm -hmm. They were thinking a certain way, and Jesus Christ mm -hmm. was trying to set them straight. Now, I really want to emphasize this in relationship perhaps to today and the idea of a secret rapture. It wasn't until Christ died that the disciples actually came out of this. They actually began to realize yes. they had the wrong theology. And it may not be until we get into the time of trouble, until we get into this time that's just ahead of us when we're going to go through it and not be raptured out of it, that a lot of us may wake up and realize, you know what? Hmm, those Adventists might have been right about some of this <laughs> stuff, right? And that's the time when you've got to be humble and just say, hey, Tell us more, a little bit more about those verses. Tell us a little bit more about the second coming of Jesus. Tell us a little more about what we're going to be going through and, and how we're going to get sealed to make it through that time. Right. And Jesus' disciples before the time were a little bit proud, a little bit self-righteous, a little bit opinionated, even arguing with Messiah, right? But afterwards, they humbled themselves. We need to always have a teachable spirit. That's good. It wasn't long ago. I was, in fact, a few days ago, I was traveling through ABN. And we were in the car with this pastor and we're talking, you know, and, and Bob's you're driving us and we're talking about Daniel 7 and we're talking about these verses. And Bob said, you know, these verses and these verses, what do they mean exactly? And I just pontificated, you know, well, that means that and that means that. And we got back and I was on the phone with, I don't know who I was talking to with somebody or on a uh, text or what. And someone had, oh no, someone texted me and they said, hey, someone just interpreted these verses a certain way and I don't think that's correct. And I said, well, that's the way I just interpreted them, right? <laughs> and they sent me a couple of statements and whatever. And I realized, wow, I got that wrong. Wow. Yes. 
And here I've been studying Daniel for, you know, (laughs) decades, and I got it wrong. And immediately I got a hold of Bob, and I said, you know what, Bob, I got that wrong. I was wrong about that. We've got to be willing to recognize if we make a mistake. Mm -hmm. Our opinions matter nothing unless they're in harmony with inspiration. So the inspired word of God is king when it comes to (laughs) directing us in the way of truth. Okay, Mark chapter 9 and verse 30. Mark chapter 9 and verse 30. And we're going to read verses 30 all the way to 32. And they departed thence and passed through Galilee, and he would not uh, that any man should know it. For he taught his disciples and said unto them, The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And after he is killed, he will rise the third day. But they understood not that Mm. saying and were afraid to ask him. Okay, Mm. first of all, they're in denial. Mm. Then they're really upset. They're sorrowful. They're exceeding sorrowful. And now they don't even want to ask him about it. Like, you know, (laughs) that theology doesn't line up with my theology, and I don't want to talk about it. I I don't even want to talk about it, okay? This is Jesus. Right. This is, I don't even want to talk about it. Come on. We've got to be willing to talk about some of this yes. stuff. We're living in a world today where people don't even want to talk. That's I've true. got my opinion. That's you true. got your opinion. Let's not talk about it. No, I think we should have the discussion. Mm-hmm. Let's have no. the discussion. And Absolutely. let's talk about it in the spirit of Christ. And let's be humble about it. And at the yeah. end, if we disagree, let's just say, well, we disagree on this. You know, you see it this way. I see it this way. And you know, in time, God's going to show us. And if indeed I believe in the rapture and, and, and you believe that, you know, we're going to go through this time of trouble, uh, when the time comes, hopefully one of us is going to be willing to say, you know, I was wrong about that. And, uh, and I need whatever wisdom you have to give me, right? right. Mm-hmm. God wants us to learn from these Bible verses what the disciples weren't willing to learn until it was late. Because Good. when it was later, it was harder. It's going to be harder for us later. So God wants us to open up now to the wisdom that he's giving to us. And the last one we're going to look at, because we're running out of time here, is Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, verses 44 and 45. Luke 9, 44 and 45. And I guess the point here, well, we'll get to that point here in a second. Let these sayings sink down into your ears. The Son of Man shall be delivered in the hands of men. Okay, I'm just going to pause here and try to make the point. Jesus is emphasizing now again and again and again. He won't stop. He did it in 16, then he did it again in 17. In other words, don't give up. You know, sometimes when we have a truth, we know it's a biblical truth. We're trying to persuade people about this truth. They're not listening to us. Don't just walk away. Don't just give up. Keep trying to push that Mm. carefully, tactfully, prayerfully when you have opportunities. Keep trying to share that truth with people. That's what Jesus is doing here. He's giving us an example. Now he's saying, let this truth sink down deep into your ears. He goes on here uh, in verse uh, 44. The Son of Man shall be delivered into the hands of men, but they that understood not these sayings, verse 45, and it was hid from them, and they perceived it not, and they feared to ask him of these sayings. <laughs> and then there arose this reason among them, which of them should be the greatest, and that's our problem. <laughs> you know, we, we, every time Jesus talked about going to the cross, out of that came this thing about who's going to be the greatest. Mm-hmm. And I think it's when we miss the teachings of Christ, when we miss the cross of Christ, when we miss the, the truth about who he was mm-hmm. and who he's going to be when he comes the second time, that we get into all these contentions. Mm-hmm. You know, we have all this division among us. And God is calling us, let these thoughts sink deep into your ears, deep into your heart. Mm-hmm. Understand me, know me, behold me, accept me for who I am and for what I've accomplished for you. And then three times Jesus told them, three times they rejected truth because preconceived opinions can effectively insulate Mm -hmm. our mind against truth. Mm -hmm. Boy, God has taken me through some things. We are going to take a very quick break. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3 ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. And now I hope you're ready for Tuesday's lesson. It's going to be a wonderful one. Jill Morricone. Thank you so much, Shelley and Pastor James. That was a powerful lesson. I feel like I've been in church. What an incredible job, both of you. I love that. Um, whew, I had a lot of things to think about when you talked about that, Pastor mm-hmm. James. That was really good. Um, 
it's good. Get out of yourself and focus on what God's really trying to teach you, you know, mm -hmm. not have those preconceived ideas. On Tuesday, I better jump into it, we're looking at It Is Finished. Of course, this is Jesus' um, cry there from the cross. If you look at leading up to the cross, um, Shelley referenced, I think, the Garden of Gethsemane and the struggle that Jesus had against the powers of darkness his entire life, but especially there in the Garden of Gethsemane. He sweat great drops of blood and saying, Father, if it's possible, please take this cup from me but not my will, your will be done. We see that ultimate surrender. We see the mockery of a trial, the false accusations made against him, mm -hmm. the scourging and the crown of thorns and the betrayal by the very people that he came to save. We see him on the Roman cross of crucifixion. We see the fierce temptations that Satan assailed him with from without. These would be the scribes and Pharisees who mocked him there on the cross. He saved others himself. He cannot save. Mm. And the temptations from within. Satan and his evil angels seeking to tempt, discourage, and force him to give up his mission. And you know they didn't give up to the very end. At the very last breath, you could say. Mm -hmm. The death of Jesus was an act of Satan because Satan instigated the events leading up to the cross. But it was an act in which Jesus won the victory over Satan. It is finished. Our verse is John 19, verse 30. If you look at the second half of the verse, it simply says this, he, Jesus, on the cross, just before his last breath, he said, it is finished. Mm -hmm. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. He died. Mm -hmm. His last words, it is finished. So I want to ask you, what was finished? What was finished at the cross? Now, the theologians at the table here may have many reasons or answers, and I have seven. So we're going to jump into it. The first thing finished, and not all of this is finished, but you could say maybe more exposed or brought to the forefront more. First thing, the redemption of man, that's you and I, was assured. I love that. Ephesians 1, if you look at Ephesians 1, that whole passage, but Ephesians 1, 7, in him, that's in Christ, we have, what's that word? Redemption mm -hmm. through his blood. We know it's not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. It's not possible for a person to die for someone else's sin. It took the blood of Jesus, the spotless blood of Jesus. Mm -hmm. He lived a perfect life. He died as our substitute and surety. The prophecies concerning Christ's atoning sacrifice came to their fulfillment, you could say, on the cross of Calvary. Because his blood was spilled, our redemption is, we could say, is assured because we all have to make that choice. So not everyone will be saved, but people will be given the opportunity to be saved. Number two, what is finished? The claims of the law, they were met. Mm -hmm. Romans 6, verse 23, the first part of the verse, what does it say? The wages of sin is death. We know that sin is the transgression of the law. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That, therefore, all of us deserve death. The claims of the law were met. Jesus stood in our place as perfect substitute and surety, meeting the claims of the law, dying in our place. Number three, salvation was offered to all. In Romans 6, 23, if we continue, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I love Shelley, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Mm -hmm. We quote it all the time. He made him, God made Jesus, who knew no sin. He was perfect to be sin for you and I, mm -hmm. that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's what I call the double imputation. So my sin is uh, Jesus bore on him, in him, on him mm -hmm. at the cross. He took my sin and I receive the gift of his perfect righteousness, mm. his perfect character. My sin credited to him, his righteousness credited to you and to me. Number four, what was finished? Satan was cast out. 
Remember Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden? They were given dominion, the Word of God says, there. But yet when they sinned, that dominion was given over to Satan. John chapter 12, verses 31 and 32. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. That's referring to Satan. I, if I am lifted up, that's when Jesus was lifted up on the cross, I will draw all men to myself. Satan lost his power or dominion, as it were, over the world he, because Christ he won the victory over Satan at the cross. Mm -hmm. That's what's discussed in Colossians 2.15, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Mm -hmm. what, when did that happen? That was at the cross. The Tsar of Ages says it this way. This is page 758. All heaven triumphed in the Savior's victory. Mm -hmm. Satan was defeated and knew that his kingdom was lost. Mm -hmm. What else was finished? Number five, the power of death was destroyed. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Mm -hmm. Because of Jesus' death, you and I have hope of eternal life, and we do not need to fear death anymore. What else was finished at the cross? Number six, I think Pastor James is my favorite. At the cross, the character of God mm. was more fully mm. revealed. Amen. You see, for even from the very beginning of sin, Satan sought to misrepresent mm. the character of God. <clears throat> we see it in the Garden of Eden. What did he say? God is restrictive. As God said, you shall not eat of every tree in the garden. The truth is God is freedom. Sin is restrictive. Sin places us in bondage. Mm -hmm. Second Peter 2 19, while they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also he's brought into bondage. What's another misrepresentation of the character of God? Satan said from the beginning, God is a liar. He is untrustworthy. What did he say? You shall not surely die. Mm -hmm. And yet the truth is, Jesus is the way, truth, and the life. And Satan is of his father, the, the Pharisees. This is John 8, 44. Jesus speaking to them says, you are of your father, the devil. Why? Because he's a liar and mm -hmm. the father of mm -hmm. it. Satan says God is selfish and he looks out only for himself. What did he say to Eve? God knows when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. The truth is Satan is selfish mm -hmm. and Christ is unselfish. This is from the cross and his shadow by Stephen Haskell. At the cross, the infinite love of Christ and the unbounded selfishness of Satan stood face mm -hmm. to face. Mm -hmm. You see, at the cross, the character of God was more fully revealed. At the cross, it was revealed that love is holy and love demands justice, but love is mercy and love paid the price for our sin. Love allows free choice. God uses freedom, not force. God uses love, not fear. God allows us the privilege and opportunity to choose him because he demonstrated his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. And finally, number seven, although this list is not exhaustive by any means, the old covenant was validated and the new covenant was inaugurated. Mm -hmm. We don't have time to read all of that, but if you read Hebrews 9, 15 to 17, what do we find out? Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant. We find that his death on behalf of transgressors attested to the validity of the old covenant and redeemed us from death, but it also inaugurated that new covenant. So the cross, when Jesus hanging there, dying for you and for me, holding out his arms, he said, it is finished. You and I were given the hope of salvation. You and I were given the hope of an eternity with him if we just open up our hearts to him and ask him to come in. Mm. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Joe. I appreciate that. I'm Ryan Day. 
and I have Wednesday's lesson entitled, He Died for Us. Mm. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, one of my favorite verses. For the message of the cross is mm -hmm. foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power mm -hmm. of God. Yes. Uh, a lot of us have read some texts here, and I'm going to continue to read some of the texts you've already heard because there's some overlap here. But it's good that we hear them over and over again mm -hmm. because repetition helps us to get, us get it in our minds and our hearts for us to be able to, to comprehend and understand the gospel plan. I'm not going to get much into the meaning of the cross because that's what Pastor John Denzi is going to give us for Thursday's lesson. But we have to understand that Jesus died for us. Mm -hmm. Why? The wages of sin is death. We find that very clearly in Romans chapter 6, verse 23. We sinned. Adam sinned. Man has sinned. All have sinned and fallen short from the glory of God except for Jesus Christ. But, of course, we know He died for us. The wages of sin is death because the law requires perfection. Yeah. And in this case, we know sin, as the Bible makes it very clear in 1 John chapter 2, verse 3, that sin, excuse me, 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, that sin is the transgression of God's law. And of course, God's law is a transcript of His perfect righteous character. We want to dwell with Him. We want to have eternal life, but we can't have that unless, obviously, the perfect, purest sacrifice is made that meets the demands of the law. Mm. Only Jesus Christ could do that. And as it has be, already been brought out, uh, Hebrews chapter 10 verse 4 brings it out very clearly, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sin. So the animals, th those were all types and shadows pointing forward to the only person in all of the universe who could pay the penalty, the perfect sacrifice for sin. He died for us. In fact, I'd like to go on and read verses 8 through 10 from Hebrews chapter 10 because it goes on to say, previously saying, sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin you did not desire nor had pleasure in them which are offered according to the law. Then he said, this is verse 9 of, of Hebrews 10, then he said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first that he may establish the second. Who does it? Christ, because he's the only one that can. Verse 10, by that will, we have been sacrificed, excuse me, sanctified through the offering of the blood of Jesus Christ. And some people would stop right there, but I want to add exactly what the Bible says, the next three letters, once for all. Hmm. And I have to emphasize that because there's a counterfeit that exists within the Christian world today, more specifically from the Roman Catholic system that t teaches that you know every single mass, every single uh, 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 service, that Christ is re-crucified and His body is broken, His blood is shed. Once again, every single mass uh, and, and that the body and the blood of Christ is recreated within this little wafer host and that uh, it, it's called transubstantiation. This is not biblical. Uh, the Bible makes it very clear that the body of Christ was given, that Jesus Christ died, once for all. And we have to make that very clear that He did it. His sacrifice was perfect and He did it for us. He died for us. There's an old song, uh, you know, that, that uh, my, one of my favorite Bible, uh, <laughs> one of my yeah. favorite authors, uh, Bible, uh, Christian authors wrote, Andre Crouch. He wrote a song called the blood will never lose its power. Mm -hmm. And I love the words because it says, the blood that Jesus shed for me Way back on Calvary, the blood that gives me strength from day to day, it will never lose its power. I love that. And it even goes on to say, it reaches mm -hmm. to the highest wow. mountain and it flows to the lowest valley. Oh, that blood that gives me strength from day to day it will never lose its power I love that song and there's so many others power in the blood and so many other songs that talk about that it's you know we talk about the blood of Christ the shed blood of Jesus but yet that blood in that blood is power the fact mm -hmm. that he shed his blood that should have been your blood that should have been my blood but the lesson is bringing out that Jesus Christ's sacrifice it was not in vain because he 
he died for us. And we know that we, what even makes it even greater is that he wasn't forced. I mean, let's, be, let's make it clear. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 21, one of my favorite verses that Jill just read. Sometimes we can read that, isolate that verse and think, oh, the Father told Jesus to do it. He basically forced Jesus to do it because it says, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Don't misunderstand that verse and please don't misapply that verse because there's plenty of others that make it very clear that Jesus Christ voluntarily stood up and said, Father, I will willingly die for them. I don't want to see my people perish. I love my children and I will gladly go down and place my life and shed my blood in place of theirs. I love Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14 which says how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit, here it is, mm -hmm. offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. I love that. He offered himself. He volunteered. He stood up and he said I'll go. I love also Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. You know, James, you mentioned earlier that oftentimes when Jesus would bring up the idea that, uh, that he was going to die for their sins, that that would often lead them to, you know, uplift themselves and talk about their own promotion. So while Christ was lowering himself, you know, they're talking about their, pro their own promotion. Well, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8 is, that re is the response for you and I. Mm -hmm. Because it says here, let this mind, which is also in Christ Jesus, uh, or let this mind be in you, which was mm -hmm. also in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. Verse 6, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Mm -hmm. Notice this verse 7, verse 3 words, but made mm -hmm. himself mm -hmm. of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Amen. Let's say it. He died for us Amen. very clearly. He died for us. He volunteered his love. And then even uh, Shelly, you brought out Hebrews chapter 12, verse two, which I love because not only did he volunteer, it says looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him. I could imagine that when Adam and Eve sinned, it didn't take a few minutes for them to all sit around the throne of God and go, mm -hmm, what's, how are we going to deal with this? I could imagine Jesus leaped up and said, Mm -hmm. I got this. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is this. It's it, like you said. It's foreordained. He was foreordained. The plan was already set in place. This is what I. This is what I exist for. Mm -hmm. I exist because I love my children, and I want to reciprocate that love and show them that I'm willing to die for them in order to redeem them. And that's exactly mm -hmm. what happened. It's good. It was love that motivated motivated Jesus. Yeah. Through Gethsemane, when he took on the sin of the world, it was love that drove Jesus to the cross for you and me. Mm -hmm. He died for us. As Moses, as, as John chapter 3, verses 14 through 18 says, and I may not read all these verses, but as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, mm -hmm. even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. I think of John 12 also. Mm -hmm. If I, I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. It, it, the Bible makes it very clear, my friends, that it was the love of God that motivated Jesus to do this. Mm -hmm. In fact, it even goes on to say uh, in verse 17, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. It could only be Him. He who believes in Him, this is verse 18 of John 3, He who believes in Him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And again, if my friend Jordan Moore was here right now. He would say, why in the world would you want to die for your sins when Jesus Christ has already Amen. freely died for them? Mm -hmm. and, and we have to understand that, you know, this is Bible prophecy speaks of it. Mm -hmm. You know, several hundred years, thousands of years before Christ even was born, he was foreordained for this. In fact, I'm, I'm right here in Daniel chapter 9, verse 26. We, you know, mm -hmm. we, we study the book of Daniel quite often. It says, and after the 62 weeks, speaking within the context of the 70-week prophecy given to, to Israel, after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off. And I love this, but not for himself. Amen. He didn't do it for himself. He did it for you mm -hmm. and me. That's what lesson, uh, Wednesday's lesson is bringing out, that Christ died for us. His death was motivated by love. He did it for you and for me. Ellen G. White says in the Ministry of Healing, page 135, I love these words. She says, if but one soul would have accepted the gospel of his grace, Christ would, to save that one, have chosen his life of toil and humiliation mm. and his death of mm. shame. Acts of the Apostles, page 209, to remove the cross from the Christian would be like blotting out the sun from the sky. 
And of course, I love this last one, Testimonies, Volume 6, page 67. Christ crucified, talk it, pray it, sing it, and it will break and win hearts. This is the power and wisdom of God to gather souls for Christ. He died for us because He loves us. And we love Him, as the Bible says, because He first loved us. Amen. Amen, amen. Well, I have heard enough to say... Praise the Lord. God bless you. We'll see you next time. <laughs> but, but we do have Thursday to cover. We do have Thursday to cover is the meaning of the cross. My name is John Dinsey. And as we go into Thursday, we're going to look a little bit into the meaning of the cross. We're not going to be able to finish this <clears throat> the short time that we have. I'm going to start with Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Mm. And it says, For I am not ashamed mm. yes. of the gospel mm. of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation mm -hmm. to everyone, to everyone what? To everyone that believes, mm. to the Jew first and also to the Greek. You see, salvation is available to each and every person because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. Mm -hmm. You are a sinner. I am a sinner. Christ is the Savior. There is no other Savior. Only Christ is the Savior. This is why you see in the book of Acts, it says there, uh, there's no other name under heaven yes. whereby we must be saved. And that name is Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And when we think of the cross, and I want to uh, highlight that we're not just talking about the cross, but he who died on the cross, Jesus Christ. Yeah. I have seen uh, many, uh, mainly guys, wearing a cross on their sh on their, uh, around their neck that were not Christians. They were drinking, they were smoking. They were not living a Christian life. <laughs> What does that mean? It means they're not really living according to what they are professing because they are professing to know Him who died on the cross. And so I pray that someday they will, if they haven't, give their hearts to the Lord Jesus Christ because it is the power of God to save everyone who believes. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3 is very uh, inspiring to me mm. because it speaks to us of Jesus in a way that we should all stop and consider. It says, for consider him who endured such hostility mm. from sinners against himself. You know, it is not only that Jesus Christ was taking the sins of those that were spitting on him, hitting him, um, saying horrible things to him, but not only that, but then there's this hostility against themselves while he was trying to work out their salvation. Mm. So, consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. There are others that may claim that they are a God, that they are Jesus Christ. Uh, I've heard of a, a man in Australia that claims to be Jesus Christ. Mm. But he is not Jesus Christ. No. I've heard of a man that in Florida claimed to be Jesus Christ, claimed he could not die, mm. but he is dead several years now. There's only one Savior. His name is Jesus Christ, mm. and he will be coming soon. In, in, the, in the book, Acts of the Apostles, written by Ellen G. White, page 273, uh, please listen to these words. The philosopher turns aside from the light of salvation because it puts his proud theories to shame. Mm. The whirling refuses to receive it because it would separate him from his earthly idols. Mm -hmm. Paul saw that the character of Christ must be understood before men could love him or view the cross with the eye of faith. Here must begin the study which shall be the science and song of the redeemed through all eternity. Mm. In the light of the cross alone can the true value of the human soul be estimated. Mm. You want to understand how much God loves you? You must consider Him who died on the cross for mm -hmm. you. There is so. such a love presented, displayed, showed that we can only but say, thanks be mm. to God who died for me, mm -hmm. a sinner. Mm. And I encourage you to consider that whatever amount of sins you have done, Christ died for them. Mm. 
And there's no amount of sins you could say that, oh, there is too much. I have done too much for mm. Christ to forgive me. Mm -hmm. Jesus says, he that cometh unto me, I will in no, no wise man. cast out. That's right. And so he is drawing you to him so that you can accept that sacrifice that he did on the cross mm -hmm. for you and for me. Uh, in the lesson, it brings out that Christ did not die just a natural death that every human being has to face. Mm -hmm. He died the second death mm -hmm. so that all those who accept him will never have to experience it for themselves. Mm -hmm. You see, because of your sins, you deserve the second death. What is the second death? That's the death that sinners will die unless they repent. Mm -hmm. It's the death that is eternal, for the wages of sin is yeah. death, eternal death. Uh, we have the possibility, I'll say the possibility because Jesus Christ may come before we die, we have the possibility of dying the first death. But thanks be to God, we don't have to die the second death because mm -hmm. Jesus Christ died, the equivalent of the second death mm -hmm. on the cross for us and for you. So the lesson brings out five things that are important aspects that we need to remember. I'm going to first list them and then we'll try to go through them rather quickly. First, the cross is the supreme revelation of God's justice against sin. Second, the cross is the supreme revelation of God's love for sinners. I would actually name that number one. Third, the cross is the great source of power to break the chains of sin. And fourth, the cross is our only hope of eternal life. That is Jesus Christ dying on the cross. Mm -hmm. He's the only hope of eternal life. Number five, the cross is the only antidote against a future rebellion mm -hmm. in the universe. Mm -hmm. Now let's go through them really quick here. First, the cross is the supreme revelation of God's justice. Romans chapter three, verse 21 uh, to I'm going to have to just read a few of these verses. Notice uh, verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. Verse 25, Romans 3, 25. Whom God has set forth as propitiation by His blood through faith, to demonstrate his righteousness because his forbearance, mm. because in his forbearance, God has passed over the sins that were previously committed mm. to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in him. Mm -hmm. Faith is a vital part of the salvation plan. Mm. By grace are we saved through faith and that not of ourselves, it is the gift of God. Let's look at aspect number, uh, or, or the second one. The cross is the supreme revelation of God's love for sinners. What can we say? <laughs> Romans chapter five, verse eight, but God commended yes. his love toward right. us and mm -hmm. that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Mm. He died for you, he died for me. So the cross reveals a love that is beyond our understanding. Let's move to number three. Number three, the cross is the great source of power to break the chains of sins. Mm -hmm. Romans chapter six, verse 22 and 23. But now having been, having been set free from sin yes. and having become slaves of mm -hmm. God, you have put, you have your fruit to holiness mm -hmm. and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, once I saw, we were watching a 3ABN program and they were doing a program about the prisoners and, and uh, the guys in prison. And a guy said, my favorite Bible verse is Romans chapter six, verse 23, the wages of sin is death. <laughs> but he liked the second part. <laughs> but Good. the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. So first he shocked me and then he, I realized that he's saying, wait a minute, the second, the wages of sin is death, but ha ha, Jesus Christ died for me. Mm. And uh, he, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So he had Jesus in his heart. Number four, mm -hmm. the cross is our only hope of eternal life. John chapter three, verse 14, 15, and 16. Uh, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, mm -hmm. even so must the son of man be lifted up that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever, 
praise God that is whoever believes mm -hmm. in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And I only have time for number five. There's only a little bit of time left. It says the cross is the only antidote against a future rebellion in the universe. Revelation 22, verse 3. And there shall be no more curse, mm. but the throne of God mm. and of the Lamb shall be in it, and His servants shall serve Him. Mm -hmm. So you see, because of the cross and Jesus Christ having the scars in His hands, it will be a forever a reminder of God's supreme revelation of His love, mm -hmm. that He died for us, and this will be an antidote. This will be something that will say, no, 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 no. Mm. It costs too much. Mm. It costs too much for my salvation, that for me to go into sin. Mm -hmm. So I encourage you to consider him who endured such suffering for your salvation and understand that he loves you and the door of, of salvation is still open for you. Amen. Beautiful Amen. lesson. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Quick closing thought. Well, one is lesson. There's a, a statement here from the quarterly that's so powerful. Jesus was born to die. He lived to die. Every step that he took brought him closer to his great atoning sacrifice on the cross of Calvary. <laughs> Fully conscious of his mission, he did not allow anyone or anything to distract him from it. And that's why we have hope. Mm. Amen. Seems like the more I study on the love of God and the cross, especially as the central focus of that, the more I realize I don't understand mm. the depth of our Father and Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the length that they have gone to. That you and I could be saved is incomprehensible, but what a gift. Amen. Amen. Gospel Workers, page 315. It says, The sacrifice of Christ as an atonement for sin is the great truth around which all other truths cluster. Mm -hmm. In order to be rightly understood and appreciated, every truth in the Word of God from Genesis to Revelation must be studied in the light that streams from the cross of Calvary. This is to be the foundation of every discourse given by our ministers. Amen. Amen, amen. We have been talking about that He died for us, but I encourage you to consider the reality that He died for you. Say, Jesus Christ died for me. Amen. amen. And I just want to add to that, that remember this, you are worth nothing less to God than the price that He paid for you with the precious blood of His Son. I hope that you've enjoyed today's lesson and that you can join us next time. Our lesson will be Christ victory over death, and it can be your victory as well. Bye-bye.